Uh, he got mixed up. He shouldn't have mixed his drugs in beer muller. Because that forced him to spew just over the road there in Guru. It all went wrong and grong grong. It rained on him in sunshine. And he had mildew all the way to Mildura. Because of that, everything came to a halt at World's End. He couldn't find any room at all at Crowdy Bay. Lost all confidence at Doubtful Creek. And felt like a bloody fool in Underball. But he was right at home at Beer On. He checked the time and how long. Oh, crikey, it was getting on a bit. So we went to bed at good night, wondering where he might be tomorrow. And we might find out later. And we might find out later. The bloke, part one. In front of so many people? Right, you're going to get a standing ovation at the end. All right, oh, you probably don't even know what that is. But you'll find out, mate. Mannix from Townsville. Never shake hands with a love stone. It isn't a wise thing to do with a clippity clap and a snippity snap. He will snip all your fingers in two. No! Our bodies are covered with blubber, and our tusks are incredibly long. We're grumpy and proud, and we bellow out loud to show that we're mighty and strong. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> bit of a gourmet traveller this time. Now you may remember that he went to bed at good night. Well, he woke up in Mornington, meandered through Meanderer and decided to find out what's cooking in Cooktown. He caught a chill at Icy Creek and a frozen jaw at Chin Chilla. But he thawed out again at Chilla Go. I didn't say they were all good, did I? <laughs> he had a cup of tea at Tea Tree, said good day to 2J and visited the butcher shop in Catapool. The bloke ate porridge in Oatly, ate an orange at Peel, had lentils in Legume, and a mandarin at orange. In balaclava he had baklava, fruit in banana, and of course Italian in Roma. Thank you. They'd run out of mangoes in Mangalo, and he couldn't find any mussels in Musselbrook. But being a bit hungry, he ate too many burgers in Burgess, and then felt like a sick marsupial at Ill Bilby. <laughs> there was no better on floating islands where he got so seasick that he threw up till Nanup. But his luck was in at luck now. When he found a uh, health food shop, but he was a bit dyslexic and he came out with misspelt bread. <laughs> but then he sank too many frothies at Foam Point and made a lot of noise to Burp and Gary. He stopped for brekkie at Eggs and Bacon Bay, got a bad case of hiccup at Beeler Up and let off some gas at Windy Corner. <laughs> he was still suffering by burrum buttock and he got the run so bad in Epsom that he didn't get his, he didn't get his pants back up till Trousers Point. He tried to buy some snail in Innisfail Bar, they were way too quick for him. You see they'd all been blown away in a couple of cyclones and then either were just larried or at the Yazi kicked. He had a good belly laugh in Happy Valley and he asked them, well, where's your poon? And they said, it's next to your fork. Well, the bloke wasn't sure where that was. So he stopped for a cuppa at Boiler, put out the fire at Burnt Yards, and uh, said bye bye to Bly Bye and Huru to Pinaroo. Still wondering where he might be tomorrow. Thank you. Grace is also six. She's another virgin of the poetry realm. Please give her a big welcome. On the plate he ran. <laughs> Thank you people for uh, giving a loan of this chair, which is what the poem's about. You might have seen this one before or heard it. It's a Bill Coon's poem. Basically it's a story before it, you know, um, there's a slots in it, you know, some of you might be aware of this, you sit on them and the <laughs> slots spread apart and you can, you know, get bit. 
<laughs> has, any, has anyone here been pinched on the bum? Uh, by the chair, I mean. <laughs> hey. Yeah. <laughs> All right. This is uh, Gordon Trapman. <clears throat> so, Trevor's on a mission to consumer affairs. He's trying to get a total ban on plastic stack of chairs. He reckons they're dangerous. A serious threat to life. Because it's through a plastic chair that he got into strife. <laughs> Who's at the Palm Creek Festival? Concert in the UK Park. Ken and Trevor there with enough supplies to last until dark. An esky full of coldies. Trevor's without a care. With his stubbies, thongs and t-shirt on his plastic stack of chair. But when he stretched both legs out, he's left crown jewel rolled free. <laughs> and dropped down through the chair seat. A real catastrophe. <laughs> but Trevor remained unaware of his dire situation until everyone gave the singer on stage a big standing ovation. <laughs> when Trevor rose up to his feet, he gave a fearsome yell. Because tethered to his testicle, the chair came up as well. He grabbed the chair with both hands and crashed back to the ground. But the errant family jewel was firmly stuck, he quickly found. <laughs> he tried to extract the enclosed clot, but he began to curse, because everything he tried didn't work. It only made things worse. Well, Trev's mate Ken was laughing, fit to go off his brain. Ken's tears were from laughter and Trevor's were from pain. <laughs> Oh, Ken produced a Stanley knife and Trevor's mouth went dry. <laughs> Ken sort of only cut the chair, but Trevor wouldn't let him try. <laughs> so Ken climbed underneath the chair and tried to poke things through. <laughs> That's when you find out what your mates will really do. <laughs> well, they pulled and pushed and prodded but all efforts were in vain. Trevor's nut was red and raw and given heaps of pain. Because all this unwanted attention is no good, you realise. Because Trevor's tortured testicle had swelled up to twice its size. Well, word spread pretty quickly around the park about the situation. And people were gathering all around to get a glimpse of Trevor's imminent castration. There are mums and dads and kids and dogs of every shape and age. Trevor's getting more attention than the singer on the stage. <laughs> Little kids were pointing and dogs had come up and trying to have a smell. <laughs> and Trevor's there trying to cover up saying, you can go to bloody hell. <laughs> Poor bloke needs an ice pack was the only bit of advice. So they sat Trevor over his esky with his agate in the ice. <laughs> Then someone called the ambulance and they drove on through the crowd. And there's Trev there drinking Bundy rum and swearing very loud. Anyway, when they both stopped laughing, the ambos carted Trev away. Back to the hospital where he became the highlight of the day. And now Trevor's fully recovered and with both crown jewels in place. Don't offer him a plastic chair if you value your face. <laughs> but next year at the festival, Trevor will be there, wearing tight undies, long trousers, on his canvas fold-out chair. <laughs> I've been running around the country. We've got the genuine here, right now, today, Campbell Buswaggy. Country down that way, and uh, till about my E, my E, the bogan moth. Here we go. <laughs> For hundreds of years, the bogan moths of the snowy mountains, a regular part of the summer food supply of the Garrigo people in the area. The dull drab coloured moss migrate to the mountains each year from the pastures and winter crops of the great nation Kui land. Collected from the resting places and the granite outcrops, they roasted in their thousands for their sweet walnut flavour. But the bogan moss were not always dull and drab. 
Indeed, long ago in the dream time and the most beautiful of all creatures of Mai the Moth with the dazzling multicoloured wings. She lived among the grasses on the river banks. She often wondered and yearned to find out for herself why the mountain high above Mount Kosciuszko has covered in white. Her husband Bogong often warned her not to leave the safety of the river grasses, but one day Mai's curiosity became too much for her. As the sun was setting, she flew up towards the mountain. She reached them just as the snows began to fall. The snow beat the fragile Mai to the ground and soon covered her. But Mai did not die. She lay covered by the snow until spring. And as the snow is melted, Mai's beautiful colours also drained away. They did so, they ran into and coloured the new spring flowers of the mountains. Why the colours of the boga moss are generally dull and lightless and only the new spring and summer wildflowers of the mountains carry the dreamtime colours of Mai, the first boga moth. Good to us creation story for you, eh? Yeah. As a tribute to, to uh, Campbell, I'm going to start with the, uh, the swag man. He was lean, and he was spare. His bushy whiskers and his hair were all fussed up and very grey. He said he'd come a long, long way and had a long, long way to go. Each boot was broken at the toe, and he'd a swag upon his back. His billy can, as black as black, was just the thing for making tea at picnics, so it seemed to me. It was hard to earn a bit of bread, he told me. And then he shook his head, and all the little corks that hung around his hat brim danced and swung and bobbed around his face. And when I laughed, he shook his head again, and he called me Kodja. Tis now you see the best days of your life, said he. But days will come to bend your back, and when they do, keep off the track. Keep off, young Kodja, if you can. It seemed a funny sort of man. And oh, the places that he'd been, I don't know what he'd not seen. In every street, in every town, all through the country, up and down. Young Kodja, shun the track, he said. And then he put his hand upon my head. And then he seemed to grow quite sad. And then I noticed but his blue eyes were very blue and very wise. I sometimes think, when I'm a man, I'll get a good black billy can and hang some corks around my hat and live a jolly life like that. Humour and beautiful poetry and uh, Mark's punny lingers. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> these are... Um, these are actually lyrics, new lyrics to an old song uh, called Whiskey in the Jar. And um, as you can hear from this, I'm getting very cranky and political in my old age. So this is a, just a political one. As I was going over the ACT cold mountains, I met with Mr. Swan and my money he was counting. He first reduced my wages, then increased the age for pension said no money for the old folk, it's gone on refugee detention. <laughs> With their fully paid super and spin, tell all the pollies to use public transport, no business class, no cars. He counted up my money and it made a pretty penny. But to our universities, he's not giving any. We've got all the latest weapons and drones up in the air, but exhausted docs in emergency and no paediatric intensive care. With their fully paid super and spin, tell all the pollies to use public transport, so no business class, no cars. If anyone can help us, it's not going to be Joe Hockey. He'd make just a good a 
chancellor as he'd make a racing jockey. <laughs> with, with his chums Abbott and Newman, they'll squee squeeze welfare till it cries. And with all their flaming fracking, the artesian water dries. With their fully paid super and spin, tell all the pollies to use public transport. And let's be ruled over by the stars. <laughs> It was written in 1988. Um, I don't very often sit down and watch morning television. This morning I did. I turned the TV on for a reason and was confronted with a horrible sight from a cemetery in Ireland where the people attending the funeral were blown up by a terrorist bomber. It's called St Patrick's Day, 1988. Today, I saw a horror in the country they call green. Well, the shamrock grows and the music flows with laughter in between. But today, there was no laughter. Just the sickly sound of bombs which shattered all those mourners' thoughts as they'd gathered round the tombs. All dressed in black, but splashed with red blood like sacrificial lambs. There was the screaming fear, a bloody face, and a religion that seemed to have become a sham. Is it a banner just to hide behind to cover up the greed or, or the waste of life that seems to fill the lust for power's need? There is no cause that's great enough to take another's life, to leave behind three kids at home and one despairing wife. All for the cause of freedom, the one side's heard to cry, and all in the name of justice is the standard stayed reply. What is this? Justice? Freedom? And God forbid religion has somehow crept in too. Hypocrisy is not an oath. It's a breaking of taboo. So in 5,000 years have we learnt no more than saying might is right or the argument that comes right back, but we can't give up the fight. But how you fight, how you fight is the knowledge lost. The secret that we need is the systematic breaking down of this cancerous growth of greed. It starts with us, the mortal one, the one who can't change that. But let me tell you, change begins within the person and then it swells to flood the vat. For all the fights this world has seen, there's none, not one that has been won, for never yet has a man changed his heart at the threat of another's gun. The change that comes, it comes from within. Acceptance is our part. It's free to link, it's free to think, it's free to live. And it's our example, like festivals like this, that shows the path. I've walked upon their emerald shores. I've partaken of their porter. I've sung their songs and heard such tales as brought my eyes to water. There's nothing sacred on this earth but the Irish knows it's worth. To be sure, it's time to put the fighting aside and let's all work for peace on earth. To Raymond James Malloy, thank you. Inviting of the gutter children fighting. <laughs> Come ceaselessly, <laughs> the tramp of feet, and their hurry faces taunt me, and their pallid, pallid faces taunt me as they shoulder one another in their rough and, rush and nervous haste, with their eager eyes and greedy of the dirty, dusty city. Of the, what? <laughs> and their stunted forms and weedy. Because as I have no time to grow, they have no time to waste. <laughs> and I somehow like to fancy that I'd like to change with Clancy, like to take a turn of droving where the seasons come and grow. Go. <laughs> well, base the round eternal of the cash book and the journal, but I doubt he'd suit the office. Clancy of the overflow. <laughs>